The third most powerful storm ever to hit the United States, Hurricane Michael, has been downgraded to a tropical storm after causing havoc in the Florida panhandle. When Michael made landfall, it had winds of 250 kilometers per hour, which has since been reduced to 110. At least two people have been killed in the storm. A state of emergency was declared in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. The authorities have urged residents to prepare for heavy rains as Storm Michael is expected to intensify again over the weekend. It was brutal, absolutely brutal. The damage that we see looking around, I really feel that it could have been a tornado. Sustained winds, it was plus 100 miles per hour. Vertical rain, you can look around. Most of the shingles are off the houses. 64 years, and um, this is my first time I went through one. And I worked for the power company and retired, so I saw a lot of storm duty. But this one here was um, the, the worst I've seen. So it was um, it was good. You, you see what it did around here? It snapped trees like they were toothpicks. It was nothing to it. So um, I'm glad I was still here. I'm glad I survived. I'm glad the car made it. Everything was close and. So it all worked out. Hurricane Michael left behind flooded homes and streets. It blew the roofs off many houses and destroyed shops. Many vehicles were submerged in water. Powerful winds, toppled trees, street lights and road signs. A quarter of a million homes and businesses have been left without power. In Brazil, thousands of protesters have marched down Sao Paulo's iconic Polista Avenue against dictatorship and fascism. The marchers rejected the first-round victory of the far-right politician Jair Bolsonaro in the presidential election. They are calling for all democratic and progressive forces to unite to defeat Bolsonaro in the second round on October 28th. I didn't expect to leave this to my children. This wasn't what I fought for in the 60s and 70s. We faced the military, and now we have to go to the streets again because of ignorance, because of craziness. I feel responsible for this election result. I think all of us fail. I'm very scared that there's a chance that Bolsonaro will become president. Our mission is to make no our answer, and I think we have 18 days to do it and try to solve the situation. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro's medical team has announced that he is still not healthy enough to take part in scheduled TV debates and other campaign activities. The far-right candidate, who is not seen as an inspiring speaker, has repeatedly missed the t television debates. He has low immunity, failing, a drop in blood pressure the need to be monitored and to get through standing and speaking for three hours isn't easy. The leftist Brazilian presidential candidate Fernando Haddad has told journalists that he is even willing to debate his opponent in the hospital if necessary, hinting that Bolsonaro may be intentionally avoiding open discussion. Our fear is that he uses ruses to avoid debate. I'm prepared even to go to a hospital room to debate him. If that's what it takes, I will go to the sick room so that we can debate Brazil. The far-right frontrunner has spooked previously supported investors while a spate of violence incidents pointed to depolarization caused by the election race. The Brazilian stock market fell Wednesday after Bolsonaro made clear his promises of privatizations and pension reform were a lot less ambitious than many expected. Bolsonaro has no plans to privatize the state-owned oil company, Petrobras, in the short term if elected, according to the president of his party, Gustavo Beni Anau. And Jair Bolsonaro's chief economic advisor is being investigated over accusations of fraud tied to pension funds of state-run companies. Federal prosecutors said on Wednesday the investigation of Paulo Guedes tapped as Bolsonaro's future finance minister has the potential to hurt support for Bolsonaro, who has campaigned on an anti-crime platform to voters tired of corruption. 
and supporters of Keiko Fujimori and anti-Fujimori demonstrators had to be separated by the police outside the prison facility in Lima where the opposition leader is being held. Her arrest comes a week after her father, Alberto Fujimori's presidential pardon for crimes against humanity was revoked by a top court. He was ordered back to prison but immediately fell ill and was taken to hospital. Keiko has published a letter to protest her innocence after being arrested. The leader of the popular force says she was arrested without evidence. She condemned the political persecution of her and her party. Keiko was detained when she went to the prosecutor's office to address the alleged illegal financing of her presidential campaign. The judge then ordered that she be detained for 10 days. The prosecutor has also ordered the detention of 19 others involved in the case, including two former ministers. I don't have the means to comment on it right now because we don't have any additional information. I suppose we will have access to that information in the coming days. For the prosecutor and judicial branch to have made the decision, it must be because there are indications or evidence against someone to detain them. We will see about this in the coming days. Our correspondent in Lima, Jaime Herrera, has more. We are right at the place where the leader of popular force Keiko Fujimori has been arrested. In some videos circulating on social media, we can see the daughter of former President Alberto Fujimori was taken by the police. She is accused of alleged money laundering. According to the judge, there is a risk of evading justice. Along with other 19 people, she is accused of receiving illicit payments, probably from the Brazilian company Odebrecht, or even from other activities such as drug trafficking. During her campaign, she said these funds were collected from different events and donations, but the judge wants her to be detained for 10 days so police can start an investigation. During this period of time, she could be sent to preventive detention. Venezuela's Attorney General Tarek William Saab says the councilman who died in detention committed suicide. Authorities say Fernando Alban threw himself from a window while under arrest in the Bolivarian Intelligence Service. The councilman was detained after being linked to the failed assassination attempt on President Nicolas Maduro in August. The fractures in the areas of his body, head, thorax and extremities are products of the fall with four wounds. They show the vital reaction, which is determinant in establishing that at the moment of the impact the victim was alive. That they drowned him, that they suffocated him, that he was already dead when he fell are rotten lies that must not be repeated. And the family and friends of Fernando Alban have laid him to rest. A religious ceremony was held at the chapel of the Central University of Venezuela, where he studied for his law degree. So far, close to 8,000 citizens have taken advantage of the return to the homeland plan. The initiative seeks to bring Venezuelans safely home from the vulnerable situations they found themselves in in neighboring countries. At 6.30 in the afternoon, the fifth flight from Peru arrived with the 94 Venezuelans who decided to leave the country. They faced challenges integrating into society there, and many had had negative experiences just for being Venezuelan. A lot of discrimination. We were humiliated. Some kids spat on my sons. That was a trigger to return to my country. Xenophobia is the main reason for these people returning who admit they were sold on an idea promoted by social networks and in the media. A lot of racism against Venezuelans. I couldn't get a decent job unless I was working in a market carrying 120 kilo bags. I should have never left the country. Never. Abuse, hatred and false promises, the experiences listed by some of these Venezuelans who today are thankful for a new opportunity to return to their hometowns, to work, move forward and recover their citizenship. A lot of NGOs trick you. They want you to stay in Peru under false hope. They don't want you to see all the positive things that the Venezuelan government is doing for us. A terrible experience. 
Last August, the return to the homeland plan was created by the Venezuelan government. It established routes for the voluntary return of migrants who don't have the means to get home alone. Upon their return home, the program welcomes all of the repatriates back into the country's social programs. We'll take a short break now. More news in a few. Telesur brings you special interviews with social and political personalities. Monday, from Washington. Tuesday, from Mexico. Wednesday, from Caracas. Thursday, from Quito. Friday, from Havana. Analysis about our continent's reality. Weekdays, only on Telesur. University students have marched throughout Colombia to protest against the budget crisis. Private universities, the Senate Workers' Union and the National Indigenous Organization were protesting against the financial situation. According to Jennifer Pedraza, a representative of the national university, the institution's budget deficit exceeds six million U.S. dollars. Our correspondent in Bogota, Paolo Fernandez, has more. Teachers and students' movements from public universities has been mobilizing to demand more resources from the national government. This is one of the five demonstrations that will take place across Bogota. Students are protesting due to an extreme budget deficit in public education. They want a new budget of close to $1 million and for the government to pay the debt it has with universities, high schools and to improve science and technology research in Colombia. The Alternative Revolutionary Forces of the Commons Party in Colombia has asked the public prosecutor to fee free Jesus Santrich. Senator Victoria Sandino says Santrich was arrested with no legal guarantees. He was accused of drug trafficking. Santrich has been charged by the prosecutor Nestor Umberto Martinez, although some say the prosecutor has no evidence against the FARC leader. Santrich is the only Colombian prisoner who has been arrested without complying with the constitutional rules for this kind of procedure. He just has an Interpol order against him, violating all judicial legislations. Thousands of supporters of the Nicaraguan president, Daniel Ortega, have marched in Managua to support their leader. The pro-Ortega Sardinistas accuse the opposition of being part of a foreign-backed coup to unseat Ortega and lambasted them as terrorists. I am marching to call for justice against the terrorists to fight for and demand that those terrorists be punished, those who killed our police. Also for there to be peace like we had before, a peace which united Nicaraguans. People are demanding this, for the terrorists to stop bothering us. Bolivia's president, Evo Morales, has led a march to recognize the Day of Democracy. The rally took place in the capital, La Paz. Crowds gathered to recognize the country's return to democracy in 1982 after a period of dictatorship. While addressing the crowd, the president reminded them that it was the working class who fought for democracy and freedom. Have gathered today to celebrate our fighters who defended democracy. This is an important date, a historical day, the day we recovered our democracy. And people in El Salvador are marching to demand that the government investigate the murder of Monsignor Oscar Romero, who was killed while celebrating mass some 38 years ago. 
Demonstrators will gather until Sunday when Romero is expected to be canonized by Pope Francis during a special ceremony in the Vatican. Romero, a symbol of social justice, will become the country's first saint. We demand that the masterminds and others who conspired in the murder come to light and be convicted by Salvadorian justice. El Salvador has once again become a symbol of impunity. Through a saint today, we are denouncing the fact that the prosecution does not act, that the organ of justice does not act. Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel, along with the former president Raul Castro, has attended a ceremony to mark the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the independence war. Several other Cuban leaders also attended the event. The day commemorated the beginning of the War of Independence against Spanish colonial rule in 1868 in the Granma province. We have fought 150 years and will continue fighting until victory always. The revolution is the same and the challenges are identical. An imperial siege from the outside, an annexation vocation of a few from within of those who do not believe that the homeland can rise with its own forces and as the only salvation unity. Let's find out more about this special date in this report. La de Majagua, located in the east of Cuba, was the scenario where the first cry for independence was heard. On October 10, 1868, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes released his slaves and called them to take arms and emancipate Cuba from the Spanish Empire. Before the newly free men, Céspedes read the Manifesto of October 10 in which he proclaimed the abolition of slavery and expressed the reasons why Cubans had to also abolish Spanish colonialism. The war started in 1868 and it lasted for 10 years. Despite its eventual failure, it served to awaken patriotic sentiments among Cubans. The 10-year war was followed by the Chiquita War of 1879 to 1880 and by the War of Independence of 1895 to 1898. This last one was headed by José Martí, the national hero of Cuba. The people of the island had to fight for almost a century to obtain their final liberation, the one that came at the hands of Fidel Castro and the rebels that on January 1, 1959, ousted Fulgencio Batista. The triumph of the revolution, as Fidel confirmed, had its roots on October 10, 1868, when Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, the father of the nation, called for a rebellion that marked the beginning of Cuba's struggle for independence. Citizens in Chile's capital, Santiago, have been surprised by a tightrope walker walking between two skyscrapers. The Moroccan tightrope walker, Mustafa Danger, made the crossing on a 75 meters high metal cable. He already has a Guinness World Record under his belt for walking a tightrope 180 meters high. This event, however, was aimed at promoting a local circus festival. Time for the second break of this show. World News is next. We are present at every event of where our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean.
Stock markets across the world have fallen sharply following a rise in U.S. interest rates and worries over trade wars. European shares followed those in Asia and the United States, falling to a 20-month low. U.S. stocks also planned suffering their worst loss in eight months on Wednesday as technology companies continued to drop. Shanghai Composite Index fell to its fourth year low. I think the Fed is uh, making a mistake. They're so tight. I think the Fed has gone crazy. So you could say that, well, that's a lot of safety, actually, and it is a lot of safety, and it gives you a lot of margin. But I think the Fed has gone crazy. And the markets plunged after that comment from the U.S. president. However, the International Monetary Fund chief, Christine Lagarde, defended the interest rate hike by the U.S. Federal Reserve. It's clearly uh, a necessary development for those economies that are now showing um, much improved growth. Uh, inflation that is picking up and falling into the range or reaching the threshold, uh, unemployment that are uh, extremely low. It's inevitable that central banks make the decisions that they make. A 6.0 magnitude earthquake has struck off the coast of Indonesia's Java and Bali Islands, killing three people. The tremor also rocked the hotels in Bali, where the International Monetary Fund and World Bank delegates are attending their annual summit. The earthquake ch comes just three weeks after a devastating 7.5 magnitude earthquake and tsunami hit the country, killing over 2,000 people. The Malaysian government plans to abolish the death penalty for all crimes and has halted 1,200 pending executions. The Malaysian parliament is set to discuss the proposed bill on abolishing capital punishment next Monday. Until the decision is official, the government has suspended the execution of more than 1,200 people on death row. Malaysia punishes with death a wide range of crimes from murder to kidnapping to drug trafficking. And now let's have a look at some of the other stories making headlines around the world. A Soyuz rocket carrying a Russian and American astronaut to the International Space Station has had to make an emergency landing back to Earth. According to NASA, the spacecraft had an issue with its booster. Search and rescue teams were heading to the touchdown area in Kazakhstan. The emergency landing was successful and both crew members are alive after the capsule went into ballistic descent mode. This again is Nick Hague's first. A dozen of activists have been boycotting the annual meeting of the International Monetary Fund in Indonesia over projects said to violate people's rights and favor the elite. The protesters gathered at the Bali International Convention Center where IMF and World Bank officials met. The activists highlighted a case in the Philippines where the IMF and World Bank funded rural development programs displaced indigenous people. Projects of IMF and World Bank have been killing our people. They're taking the lands from our indigenous people and we want those voices to be heard. And here in Indonesia, we expect a democracy. We expected a lot of support, both by the locals, even from the IMF World Bank, but that's not happening. Cyclone Titli, with winds up to 165 km per hour, made landfall on the east coast of India. The town of Gopalpur was at the center of the cyclone, which destroyed huts, twisted trees, and cut power lines, leaving thousands without electricity. At least 300,000 people had been evacuated from the low-lying areas of the region. Three rafts in the Mediterranean Sea carrying at least 94 people have reached the shores of Andalusia in Spain. Despite the strong storms which affect the region, rafts continue to arrive with dozens of migrants on board. Over the last three days, more than 800 migrants have arrived in Andalusia. Our correspondent Sergio Rodrigo tells us more. 
Turbulent weather has been affecting the Mediterranean coast. At least nine lives were lost in Mallorca. Migrants have been attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea and at least 13 boats have been intercepted. The most recent of those was transferred to the Montreal Granado port. Another 44 has been assisted by the Red Cross and subsequently handed over the police. Many immigrants continue to flee the persecution in the north of Morocco, where they continue to demand universities, work and hospitals. Many of these migrants are calling for international protection. Moroccan public television has confirmed that Royal Moroccan Navy far a migrant boast with infants on board. There were no victims, but we must remember that just a week ago, the Royal Moroccan Navy far a migrant ship in which 20-year-old girl was killed. A team made up of refugees from Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Ethiopia and many more countries is officially confirmed to compete at the 2020 Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. The International Olympic Committee President Thomas, Thomas Bach made the announcement but says he hopes this will send a message of hope and happiness to the millions of refugee athletes around the world so they too can share and enjoy the Olympic spirit. This will be the second time in history that a group representing migrants participates in the Games. The first was in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. And we've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at talisiotv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Talisio English, I'm Sani Gray. Thank you for watching.